Good afternoon. Welcome to the wedding of Brandon and Rosie. So I'd like to welcome my parents and my, my mother-in-law and uh, Helmut's family here, our relatives, a lot of them, and our friends and family and our church family, all the people we fellowship with, all the people that are important to Brandon and Rosie in their lives. In Revelation 19, I want to read you, or share a couple of verses with you. Revelation 19 says, Hallelujah. <sighs> oh boy. Anybody got that handy? <laughs> That's actually Revelation 19 is where that word hallelujah first appears in the New Testament. Let us give glory unto the Lord. Let us rejoice and be glad for the marriage supper for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. If you ever wondered if the Bible says anything about marriage, that's quite an understatement. The Bible, the Bible begins and ends with marriage. In Genesis, we have a husband and a wife, a man and a wife, and in Revelation, we have the Lamb of God and his bride. And so today we have a picture here, another picture Every time we have a marriage, we have a picture of that amazing wedding that's coming in the future when Jesus Christ is going to be married to his bride. So before we begin, I'd just like to pray with you and commit this time to the Lord. Father, we just thank you for the beautiful weather. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. We thank you for this picture this morning, this afternoon of marriage. Father, we thank you for Brandon and Rosie for their commitment to each other, for their willingness to, to honor you in this part of their life. And we pray for your Holy Spirit today to speak to us and through us. Minister to Brandon and Rosie and to each one here. May your blessing be upon this time. May your presence be here with us, with us today. Amen. There are two songs in your programs. If you want to open up your your uh, program there, and we'll start in the order that they are. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious.
how deep the Father's love. Wow, good afternoon. We didn't know if we'd have storm or rain or maybe we'll have all of it today yet. But regardless, welcome here. I'm glad to see so many could make it out today uh, to celebrate. It's a celebration of Brandon and Rosie. So uh, just as um, every child has their own unique character, uh, all eight of our children are very unique and have a very, very different ideas and very different characters. And each of them would tell you a different perspective on different experiences that we've had because of the way they look at things. And uh, today, Brandon and Rosie have their special story that they want to share with you. And so I just want to give them an opportunity to share a little bit of their story and just of uh, the faithfulness God of God in their lives. So I'm just going to hand it, this over to them for a little bit. We, t we, t we titled it Our Love Story. There it is. The first time that we met was at a large homeschool get-together. I didn't really take note of Rosie, <laughs> except that I observed her beating Alana, my very in the foot race, which means that she was fast. <laughs> I didn't notice who Brandon was, except that there was a crazy guy at that same get-together that ran the one-mile race, who I later found out was Brandon. If we fast-forward several months, 
from that time to April of 2018, where we were both at a Jack and Jill bridal shower of mutual friends. It was during that evening, which was the first time we had seen each other in over four months, that I noticed how fun she seemed. <laughs> a couple of things that stood out to me. She was very real. I was not trying to put on a face to impress anybody, particularly other young guys or myself. Her surrendered heart to Christ was also very evident. I had previously met Brandon's sisters, but at the Jack and Jill party, I found out for the first time that Brandon existed. Um, <laughs> two things that stood out to me about Brandon were his love for the Lord and how he, how well his um, siblings. Over the next few weeks, just through different events and group meetings, we saw each other a couple more times, and I was beginning to very seriously consider whether or not she was the one. Again, fast forward several months to October or November, I don't remember exactly. I was even more seriously considering her in that way. One evening I talked to my dad about it. He mostly just smiled, <laughs> and then he told me not to do anything to manipulate the situation on her part to try to get her attention. I knew that he was right, and I am very grateful that he encouraged me in that way. In late April, the following spring of 2019, I brought it up with my dad again, and asked him what he thought I should do. He encouraged me to discuss my interest with Rosie's dad for the first time, so that her dad would know of my interest and that he would have time to consider the matter and be able to make an informed decision when the time came. Her dad told me that she was not yet ready and that I should continue to wait on the Lord and pray about it and that he would talk to her when she was ready. The day after my dad got the email from Brandon, my siblings were teasing me that, um, that somebody would come and ask for me. Um, so my mom joined the conversation She right then. She's like, yeah, Rosie, what would you say if somebody would come for you? And I told her, I'm not ready to get married. I wouldn't know about it. You wouldn't tell me. So that was their answer. They weren't sure at first if they were going to tell me, but that was their answer. I was not ready yet to hear. Last, last summer, I was at Ellerslie Disciple Training Institute. The Lord used a number of circumstances to show me that I needed to completely surrender my dream of marrying Rosie. And all of that, I felt that I needed to email Helmut and tell him not to go ahead with talking to Rosie about my interest in her. I just needed to completely surrender it. Through the time there, I spent a lot of time praying for Rosie, very specifically that she would keep herself for her future husband, whoever that might be. She wouldn't be distracted by young men, including myself. <laughs> the next several months were a good time of trusting the Lord and learning to walk closer with him. In the fall of last year, I also went to Ellerslie. During my time there, I was able to come to a point of complete surrender to the Lord. Before, yes, I had surrendered, but there was always a hesitation. The biggest thing for me was, if I surrender my desire to get married, what if the Lord called me to be single my whole life? But while there, I realized that I can completely trust him. If the Lord want, wants me to be single, he would change my desires and give me fulfillment in that if I continue to seek him. And if he wanted me to get married, he would provide the right man in his timing. So either way, I could trust him. Around this time, Brandon came to mind quite often. I tried to push, him, push it aside. I had committed to guarding my heart. I didn't want to think myself into a relationship. But it kept coming back, so I decided to pray for him. I used his name only once in my prayer. Afterwards, I just prayed for my future husband. In late November of 2019, it got a lot harder for me to not think about Rosie. I tried very hard to just completely surrender her and let her go, but it became evident that the time was, it was time to do something about it again. After talking with my dad and another brother, I knew that it was time to talk, speak with her dad again. We went out for coffee and talked for four hours. <laughs> when I left, I was very encouraged in the Lord, first of all, and secondly, I was completely willing to wait as long as I needed as long as it took for her to be ready. In early December, it got really hard for me not to think about Brandon. I, s I remember one day I stopped what I was doing and thought, would I be okay if Brandon married someone else? That was hard to me for me to think about. I realized then that it meant too much to me. Again, I had to surrender him to the Lord. 
I thought, Brandon would never be interested in me anyway. <laughs> he probably doesn't even notice me. I just needed to come to that point so that I could forget. One thing that really stood out to me about Brandon is that I did not notice that he was interested in me. And so that's why I had, I had to come to that point. Like, I had no idea that he had already talked to my dad. I had no idea that he was interested in me. So, <laughs> um, but one morning, two days later, my mom asked me if I wanted to just sit and talk with her. I was happy to because my mom was a fun person to talk to. <laughs> um, we talked for a bit and somehow the topic of relationships came up. She asked me, you always like reading relationship stories about other people's relationships, right? I nodded and then she asked me how it would be if I read my own story. I told her that would be weird. Then she told me, well, we're in that situation. <laughs> She told me that a young man had asked for me, and before she told me who it was, she asked if I wanted to guess. I said no. <laughs> I didn't want to get my hopes up, but I thought of Brandon right away. <laughs> then she let me write, read the first email from Brandon. As soon as I saw who it was from, my heart skipped a beat. After a bit of discussion with both my parents, and after asking some questions, I told my parents that I had been praying for Brandon for three months. I right away felt peaceful and excited to start a courtship with Brandon. Very early on in the relationship, Rosie asked me a question one time when we were talking. And it was a question that I was already wrestling with and trying to come to a firm decision on. She asked me what I wanted to set as boundaries within a courtship, specifically about physical contact. I knew that it would I already knew that it would be good to commit to not touching each other physically before marriage, but I wanted my decision to be from the Lord and directed by him. I knew that if I did not have a conviction from him, and if I did not look to him to give me the strength to walk in that conviction, I would fail. That week, I spent a lot of time praying about this and really asking the Lord to show me what he would want us to do in this. Near the end of the week, I was driving home and praying about it still when I had a realization that I believe was from the Lord. I needed to treat Rosie like another man's future wife. Even though we were in a relationship with the goal of marriage, we were not married. That made it very clear to me. I wouldn't hug another man's future wife. I wouldn't hold her hand. And I wouldn't even tell her that I loved her. I knew I needed to take the time simply to get to know her and to seek the Lord's will in it. Whether or not we were to get married was what I needed to find out. My intentions from the beginning were to decide if Rosie were my future wife or not. This May, shortly after Rosie and her family returned from their trip to Mexico, I knew it was time to ask her dad for his blessing on her marriage. His answer to me asking was, absolutely, <laughs> which is kind of what I wanted and expected to hear. <laughs> Two weeks later, Rosie and I were talking. We were walking around the backyard here. I was checking to see how she was doing and asking her if there was anything that she was struggling with in our relationship. She was evidently at peace. I then told her that there was something I wanted to talk with her about for the past several weeks but I hadn't been sure how. So I said to her, unsure of how to proceed properly, I said, there's something in our relationship that I'm not happy about. Not unhappy, just discontent. I was thinking at this point, okay, Rosie, just get ready to receive correction. It's okay. Like, I want to know if there's something that I've done that, that needs correcting. I continued. I don't want you to be my friend anymore. <laughs> I would rather have you be my wife. I have never told you this before, Rosie, is what I said. I love you. That was the first time I told her I loved her. And then I asked her, will you marry me? I didn't suspect anything until he told me that he didn't want me to be his friend anymore. Then my heart started beating faster. Um, when he asked me to marry him, I said yes right away. I felt that it was appropriate to make this the first time I held her hand as I put the ring on her. After that, we committed to not touch each other again until our wedding. I saw how important it was to get to know Rosie as a person without being distracted by any physical attraction. We wanted to save the physical part of the relationship for when we were married. We believe that that is the Lord's best. Truly, this commitment we made to each other would have been impossible if it were not for the Lord giving us the strength to have self-control. There was even a time where we chose not to see each other for a week 
because it was so difficult for me to keep those boundaries we had set. This was a hard decision to make, but I realized that I needed to refocus on the Lord and what his desire for us was in this. I needed a renewed vision to keep the boundaries, and I needed it to be from him. Since that week, my attraction to Rosie has not been any less. On the contrary, it has been greater. But he has given me the strength to have self-control. Truly, the Lord has been faithful to both of us in this, and he deserves the glory and the praise for how we were able to keep this commitment. We stand here now, ready to see the fulfillment of this commitment. It's very special for me, because there was one time we were driving together, and we were just talking about how our relationship had gone. And I just, it struck me, all the time that I had been praying for Rosie to be keeping herself for her future husband, to not be distracted by me or anybody else, I suddenly dawned on, dawned on me that I had been praying for myself, <laughs> and I was the man that she was keeping herself for. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, it tr truly has been a blessing watching uh, Rosie grow up and seeing her grow in, in her character and in maturity and getting to know Brandon and just seeing his steadfastness and how his, his word means something. Uh, when he sets his mind to, to doing something, then uh, it's, his yes is yes and his no is no. So, um, well, so I wasn't given a specific passage. I was just given a topic, a general topic to speak on. And so um, I figured since uh, the topic encompasses all of Scripture, uh, we'll have to just start in Genesis and work our way through the Bible. And since weddings are a seven days, right? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I hadn't actually talked to the couple about this, but uh, well, maybe I can maybe I can leave out some of some details. Um, I do though want to start with a little introduction to the Bible because, as we will find out, the marriage relationship doesn't make sense until we understand the Bible. And so, a quick overview: the Bible is a history book. It actually is the only accurate history book in the world. Every other history book is written for, from the perspective of a man and from the perspective of the victor of whatever uh, war or whatever there was. Um, and we see that even today, as we see what's happening in the world around us, how there are riots and there are statues of commemorating historic times being torn down and history is being rewritten in front of our eyes right now that will be taught to future generations as fact. And, uh, and so it's, it's very important to know that the only his history that we can actually stand on is the historic, accurate word of God that is written from his perspective, which is eternal and and uh, uh, will last forever. And this does not change. It is God's story. And it is all about one person in particular. And that person is Jesus Christ. It's all about him. It starts with him. It ends with him. And everything in between is about him and points to him. Now later, we come into that story but we are only part of his story. We start with a story about Adam and how Adam created perfect but fall, fell into sin. Now something had to cover that sin. And so God killed the very first animal and shed that blood to atone for as a symbolic uh, gesture, not the perfect sacrifice, but as a, as a symbol to spiritually cover Adam's sin with the blood of this animal. Now, when Jesus came, 
He was called the second Adam. He lived without sin and therefore was able to fulfill the requirements of the law and of his father. Throughout the Old Testament, we see prophecies pointing to this. We see pointing to the Messiah, and we see types of Christ, like David, who point to Jesus, who would fulfill everything. Now, this will all make sense to you in a bit. I know you think I'm going off track here, but really, I'm not. <laughs> the law and the prophets all pointed to Christ for 4,000 years, and yet most people did not understand it. Their eyes were blinded. Even the disciples who walked with Jesus for three years did not understand. In Luke 18, Jesus is talking to them about his death, his resurrection, and the kingdom of God. And in verse 34, it says, But the disciples understood none of these things. And the meaning of this statement was hidden from them. And they did not comprehend the things that were said. It wasn't until Jesus died and rose again that their eyes were opened and they understood. In Luke 24, it says, Then they remembered his words. And in verse 45 of the same chapter, it says, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And so it was at the death of Jesus that all of a sudden everything they had learned from the rabbis, everything Jesus had taught them, all of a sudden it made sense. Not, long, not that long before, they had all scattered when they saw Jesus being taken by the soldiers. Why? Because they didn't understand their faith. They were not ready to die for their faith. But now they truly understood. Now they were ready not just to live, but to die for their faith. Where am I going with this? Doesn't sound very weddingly yet. Well... Actually, the whole 4,000 years that this story had been going on, there's another story that parallels this story. Happening in the background, in full sight. If we go back to Genesis, we find an interesting verse. Let's go back to Adam in Genesis 2. We see that God makes Adam in his own image. He puts him in the Garden of Eden, and gives him the job of naming all the animals. That's quite the job. We don't know how long it took, naming all the animals, tending the garden, but he eventually figured out that there was no partner for him. So God took one of his ribs and made him a wife. So in chapter 2 of Genesis, in verse 23, we read, And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Here we have an interesting saying. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That doesn't make sense. That, that's something spiritual. That is something out of this world. In the same way that the people didn't understand the many prophecies and metaphors that were pointing to Christ, they also didn't understand the significance of the marriage relationship. Well, the best way to interpret scripture, if we want to know what this means, is to allow scripture to interpret itself. So let's see if we can find the explanation in the New Testament. Let's turn to Ephesians 5, in 30, verse 31, where Paul is quoting this exact passage. He, Paul says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. This is a mystery. It's been a mystery from when Adam was created till now. It's been a mystery.
But Paul says, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. The mystery has been revealed. Paul is saying here that all this time, the joining of husband and wife in marriage has been a mystery that has been pointing to something. And only now, after Jesus has died and has risen from the dead, are we able to see the true purpose of marriage. The mystery is that the marriage relationship is a portrait of the relationship of Christ to his church. The re that relationship is the real marriage. Christ and his church is the real marriage. The question is, what kind of portrait are we painting with our marriage? In the same way that a painter looks at something real to make a portrait of it, we can look to the real marriage relationship and create a portrait that looks as much as possible like it. So let's take a closer look to see what that looks like. Ephesians 5, to 24 speaks first to the wives. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Here's what Paul is saying. You make your marriage an accurate portrait of the real marriage when you willingly submit to your husband's leadership. Submitting in everything is a tall order. And it means exactly what it says, that you submit in everything just as the church submits in all things to Christ. You are to do so willingly. This is not a cross to bear. It is your unique calling and privilege. This is the role that God has given you in which you have the opportunity to beautifully display the gospel. This does not mean that you follow your husband into sin. Being submissive doesn't make you a doormat. Your submission to your husband is a component of your greater submission to Christ. God is still your higher authority, and our obedience to him always comes first. Remember that you are not submitting for your own happiness or peace, but to be that portrait of how the church is to submit to Christ. The beautiful thing, though, is that if you do this, you will actually find that peace and joy that everyone is looking for. So, Rosie, you are his helper which means your life is wrapped up in his. Whatever he longs for, or whatever he longs to be, however he uses his gifts and passions and calling, you are to join him in that. His mission is your mission. His calling is your calling. His passion is your passion. So join him, serve him, love him, respect him, and you will live out your part of this portrait this image of the real marriage. Paul continues and is speaking to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. You, Brandon, have the unique task of displaying the gospel in your willing, joyful, loving leadership of your wife. In this portrait, you are, all, you are called to be an accurate portrayal of Christ. Brandon, you are to be toward Rosie as Christ is toward his church. It's interesting that the first thing that Paul says to wives is to submit to the leadership of the husband. But he doesn't tell the husband to lead well. Instead, he tells them to love well, just as Christ loved.
as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is not emotion or fuzzy feelings, although those are great and you should have lots of those. Love is an action. It's, an, it's to act in love towards her. <clears throat> the model for your love is Christ's love for his people. How did Christ love his people? How much did he love his bride? He loved in action, not just in words or feelings. He gave himself up for her. He gave up his life. You are to lead in love, in forgiveness, in repentance, in sacrifice, in giving of your time, your attention, your very self. You are to lead by loving first and loving most and loving best, by loving to the very end. How do you do this? You make your marriage an accurate portrait of the real marriage by washing your wife in the word. As part of your God-given role, you are to lead in washing your wife with the word of God. Jesus' relationship to us is all about the word, about bringing us into submission to his word. His word saves us. His word now calls us to be holy. Our unique task as husbands is to take this time, is to take this same word to our wives, to speak it to them, to challenge them in it, to help them apply it to their lives. So why are you as a husband to give yourself up for Rosie and wash her in the word? Because you get your marriage as close as possible to the real marriage when you prepare your wife to be presented to Christ as holy and unblemished. Marriage is about holiness, the same way the Christian faith is about holiness. Christ died to make his people holy. You are married to make your wife holy. What a privilege and responsibility you now have to start your own portrait, to display the gospel and to bring glory to him through your marriage relationship. Are you ready to begin your own journey? Would you like to say your vows? Rosie, my vows to you are very simple in a way. I I vow to always remain faithful to Jesus, my Lord and Savior. In reality, that is the only way by which I can stay committed to you. In terms of being your husband, I will, however, be more specific. Rosie, I will continue to complain and grumble when you remind me to eat either breakfast, lunch, or supper, or all of the above. But then I will remind you that that I know that you are right and that I agree with you. And that I like it when you show your care for me in that way. I will always wake you up gently and encourage you to embrace the new day. Rosie, I will encourage you to be looking to the Lord and to be relying on him to be your source of strength. I will make time to spend with you in his word, leading you into a deeper understanding of the Lord and his ways. Rosie, I will always love you. As it says in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, I will dwell with you with understanding and give honor to you as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. I will always listen carefully when you are struggling and I will continue asking those questions that help you understand your struggle. Rosalind, in all my days I will remain faithful to you in action and in intention of heart. I will not turn from loving you. I will be your leader and husband until we are parted by death. I love you. Brandon, I am so thankful to the Lord for blessing me with you. I am honored and excited to have you as my husband. By the grace of God, I promise to love you unconditionally. I will serve you with joy and submit to you as my husband, my spiritual leader, and the head of our home. 
Just as I'm called to carry the Lord's name well, so also I will strive to carry your name well. In every season of life, in good times or in hard times, with much or with little, whether sick or healthy, I promise to stick by you and care for you until death parts us. I will laugh with you and cry with you. I will encourage you, pray for you, seek and trust the Lord alongside you. I vow to stand with you for the truth, even if it means we stand alone. I will be your safe place, someone you can always talk with and trust. I will be your helper and homemaker. I will follow you wherever the Lord leads and support you in it, even if it's outside my comfort zone. Where you are, that is where my home is. For years, I have committed to guarding my heart. Brandon, you waited for the Lord's timing, and because you did it his way, you have won my heart. Now I entrust it fully to you. There is no one else I want to spend the rest of my life with. You are my best friend. I'm honored to be your girl. I can't wait to start our life together, walking in the ways of the Lord. Brandon, I love you. Well, in the presence of these witnesses that you have invited to be here, having heard your vows and the commitments you have made to each other, I give my daughter Rosie to you, and I pronounce you husband and wife. You may now hug your wife. I would like to invite um, Jim and Vera and come up here, and we just want to pray for them. Lord, we just want to thank you today for your faithfulness. <clears throat> we see our frailties as parents, and uh, we know our, we're finite, and yet you are infinite. Lord, and you go beyond whatever we can do when we bring it to you in prayer. And so we see here today these young people starting out their new life, and we just pray your blessing on them. We pray that they you today as much as they desire to honor each other and that they would walk with you in, in faithfulness that you would just pour your life in and through them and may they be a testimony to this world of Christ loving his bride Lord may they, the joy of the Lord be their strength all their days always look to you bless them with your, your, with your, with your peace that passes all understanding Lord that those times they have to stand alone they would do it with joy and with gratefulness. Amen. Father, we thank you for Brandon and Rosie. And we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness and the way you've seen you working in their lives, in their, in their relationship, and how we see that you are guiding them in truth. We can t pray that you would continue to guide them as they continue to seek you, that wherever they go, that they would continue to be that light and that salt to the world around them, that the world would see you in them, and that the world would be changed as a result of their presence. We just pray your, ask your blessing on them, and that you would help them to continue to grow in wisdom and in knowledge, and uh, grow stronger in their commitment and resolve to serve you all their days. Amen.
So, I guess I want to introduce you to you for the first time in history, Mr. and Mrs. Brandon Loudon. I was asked just to announce that uh, there is a brief uh, pause here between the ceremony and the reception. If you guys want to just hang around and talk, looks like we might get a little sprinkle, but there's places to get under shelter, either in the Quonset over here or the tarp building, uh, different roofs here and there. So feel free to stay around no matter what. The couple as well as the family, everybody wants you to stay. So there's lots of food to be shared later. Uh, beyond that, Brandon and Rosie are very happy that all of you could make it and just want to spend a lot of time just being able to have a good party here tonight yet. 